I'm Angela Little and I'm currently a board member of Culture Valley. And it's my great pleasure this evening to uh, introduce our, our special guest, our author, our translator, um, Jennifer Cuny Draskow. Um, this is a rather unusual book in as much as it is an English translation from Norwegian. Uh, the book in English is A Thousand Years in Man, and the book in Norwegian is... Tis a Man. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> um, and I'd like to explain really how this little project uh, came about. Um, some years ago, I worked at the University of London uh, with a Norwegian academic called Jon Lauglo. And Jon Lauglo was uh, the son of a great friend of the author of this book in Norwegian, another Jon, Jon Lerfall. Now, Jon Lerfall was a politician, historian, and uh, he came to the Isle of Man in 1979. He had already written by that time a book about uh, the Vikings in Shetland and the Orkneys, and he wanted to explore much further the, the role of the Vikings and the Viking settlement in the Isle of Man. And he did it in the year of our millennium. And he produced this book, and uh, the book, uh, a copy of this book was, was given to the father of my friend, Jon Lauglo. And then when uh, Jon's father died, of course, Jon inherited it. Um, Jon passed it to me, uh, saying that I think that both I and my father would like to think that this book had been returned to the Isle of Man. Um, and uh, then I thought, well, you know, what am I going to do with this? He sent me a link to a a, a translation program that might help me to translate this from Norwegian into English, but I couldn't get on top of the software. And then by pure chance, um, one evening, I think it was a pobble Christmas dinner down at the shore in Gansey, I just happened to overhear Jennifer, I think talking with Max or somebody around, and you said something about Norwegian, and I heard this, and then we got talking, and I said, Jennifer, I have this book you might like to read. So I lent it to Jennifer, and before you could say, I was going to say Jack Robinson, but perhaps I should say Dewey Watterson, um, or whatever, <laughs> what, whatever, <laughs> Max, whatever the Max equivalent would be. Perhaps <laughs> <That's laughs> I should say, or <laughs> Phil Gorn. <laughs> um, before I could say Phil Gorn, uh, Jennifer had translated this into English, and had sent it to me by email. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was just, she just did it immediately. And then we, we, we started thinking about it, and we thought, well, why don't we publish this translation as a Culture Vannin book, which is what we've done. And um, just a, a one final note is that we had actually invited John Lauglo, my academic friend, to co-write the preface to the book with myself, and he'd agreed to do that. Um, we took a decision in Culture Vannin to publish the book um, I think it was in May, and I was on the point of sending him an email um, to, to let him know, and I received an email from Norway to say that he had died um, the day before, um, very unexpectedly, during a fairly routine operation. So it's very sad, um, but we have sent um, a copy of the book to his wife, and uh, I know that uh, he would have been absolutely delighted. He was delighted to know that we were going to go ahead or plan the project, and he would have been delighted to know that it, it had finally come to fruition. So without further ado, I would like to um, welcome uh, Jennifer, who I think is known to all of you and must be one of a tiny, tiny handful of people on the island who can read and translate uh, Norwegian. They probably know me for nothing good, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good to you, Jennifer. May I stand here because um, not only is it more protected behind the leg, <laughs> but um, also the, there's a couple of books I'm going to lift up um, if I can read this. The Erin Stolen, Beauty and Alice, all of us, they come in here till till culture man in, till lancering in our book and to use an oracle man of young Lerfall. And I'm not going to say any more about the content of Jan Leerfeld's book because I think he does that adequately himself rather than bore everybody and tell you all the content so by, by that time um, you're sick of it and you don't feel like acquainting yourselves further with it. Uh, I will however mention what for me has been the USP of this book and that is 
I'm glad Katrina isn't here in a way. I'm sorry she's sick, but I can't do the accent. But it is Burns, isn't it? Um, would the gods the gift of years to see ourselves as others see us? That was a very bad Scottish. And I'm fascinated by those pictures of the Isle of Man that people have taken in Cumbria places. And they say, that's your Snae Fell. That's your point of air. And I think, oh yeah, it is, it is, isn't it? Yes. What a different perspective. What a different angle. How interesting that is. Now, right at the turn of the 60s, my dad was in charge of something huge and naval and based in Edinburgh. And we took the visit, the official visit, of a Norwegian warship called Håkon den Suvende, Håkon the Seventh. And when the captain came along the line being introduced to people, he said to my mother, Madam, I would like to offer you my most heartfelt apologies. And my mother said, Captain? And he said, you are a Manx woman. She said, indeed I am. He said, I wish to apologize to you for what my ancestors did, ancestors did in your beautiful island. <coughs> and my mother burst out laughing, which was uncharacteristic of my mother. And she said, but I'm one of you, because my mother was a corkle. And they spent the rest of the time over the canapes and the sherry and whatever, discussing the etymology of all the Manx surnames that begin with C-O-R, because they all contain the name of the great martial god, Tor. And so, Korkel was Maktorkitil. Um, we get our word kettle probably directly from that kettle, although there is a Latin word meaning of that where it might have played a role in it. But Torkitil is... Um, the, the, or Ketil, is the seething cauldron of Tor, which was apparently one of his emblems. And so that's what the Korkels are. And the fact that Tor, Tor Ketil becomes Korkel um, bears witness to two things, one of which Professor Max, Max Wheeler would be much better able to um, elaborate than me, which is the habit and inclination of languages to get rid of elements that they don't like in their phonological system so that they, um, they lost the ma of the k sound very early and then that they got rid of that t in the middle of it all because that was difficult with a c coming before it and so on they didn't like that and so the fact of it became corica which is probably much easier for anybody and um, i've spent a lot of this year translating norwegian not just this lovely book which i'll come to in a minute but i started off translating something by a Norwegian writer and brought it along to St. Sia. Um, her name is Gunnild Havnes, and she has made it her purpose to recreate or to write to fictionalize the sagas, but using women protagonists rather than male protagonists, because in the sagas, if you're familiar with the sagas, people are someone's daughter, concubine, sister, mother, and there they are, and they have some children and they die, and that's it. Whereas the men are very heroic and go out and undertake all sorts of deeds. And she said, well, there's got to be a balance in this. And one of the scenes that she recreates and brings, puts me in mind of a time when the late Dr. Brian Stowe and Dr. Fenella Basin and I were at a conference on Prince Edward Island in Canada. And on the away day of the conference, we embarked on a boat a large motorboat, in the middle of which there was a great cauldron worthy of Tor, cooking a whole lot of mussels, which stank to high heaven, in which I did not participate, partake of. And there was a lot of Canadian mist, and it was a bit like the Isle of Man, like Banana, and we couldn't see the coast of Canada. We were escorted by a saga scholar, Sigurdur, from Iceland, and he said, could you, and, oh, we were also fortified by large quantities of Icelandic schnapps, which he provided us with, which made the whole thing much more pleasurable. And he said, if you could see through the mists there, that is almost certainly the site at which one of the battles between the Vikings and the Skrellinger took place. And the Skrellinger is a very dismissive term used by the Nordic peoples of indigenous peoples. And it means rather disorganized, badly clothed people who come out of bushes with war groups. You know, a bit like uh, the Greeks called everybody who didn't speak Greek that they encountered as barbarians because they said their language is ba 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 nobody can understand it. So the Skrellinger and the Vikings were having a set too. And this is proof of the fact that women sailed with the Vikings. And the Vikings weren't doing very well because there was only one boat load of them. There were lots of Skrellinger all doing war hoops and carrying spears. When the Viking women, much as the women in Sandwood in our own history did, except that the Viking women didn't just bang on kettles and things, they rushed into the fray, lifted up their garments, and revealed themselves to the Skrellinger 
who was so appalled that they shrieked and yelled, dropped their weapons and fled howling into the bushes. <laughs> and the Vikings carried the dead. And, and she, um, Gunhild, reenacts this in her, in her book here. Um, Freudus was actually the sister of Leif Eriksson, and these people were Leif Eriksson and his people who were busy discovering um, Vinland, Vineland, the good, and trying to persuade other people to go and settle there because it was all full of vines and it would be lovely. And when I told her about this book, Tuza Nordperman, she said, Jan Lerfer was such a well-known and respected politician, I didn't know he'd written about the Isle of Man, so I must get hold of the book. So that was a Norwegian testimony, wasn't it? And another of the things, I did two of these, and this one I brought along because um, it's called Kong Set, it's a modern book, and half the action takes place in the Isle of Man. You can have a look at it afterwards, you can have a look at the sort of fly, you know, I don't know what they're called, the cover, the dust cover, you know, the inside. And it's, it talks about Ronald's Way and it talks about Castle Russian. And it talks about figures that we know from our history, such as Ivan, Rongvalder, uh, Olaf, Magnus, we know all these names, and they all feature in this book here. And then, wonderfully, Tusenor Paman fell into my clutches through the good offices and good graces of Professor Little. And I thought, this is wonderful, and new, and factual, and how interesting. And that's how I started to work on that, and the result of which you see today. And of course, we've always been fascinated with the Vikings. If you turn on the television, you've only got to see Neil Oliver in a boat with his hair flowing, going off to school's <laughs> left, or um, um, whatever it is, or, or Gokstap or Yellinger and telling us all about the Vikings, because they were charismatic, they were brave, they were innovative, they were pragmatic, and there's something about them, isn't there, that's fascinating. Um, and we, we do that in the Isle of Man, and probably with just as much justification. I mean, we have reenactments, and we have long ships, and we have boats probably built only two-thirds the size, and probably never intended for those purposes anyway, um, doing voyages. And we have people running around peeling in horned helmets that really belong more in um, an amateur version of a Wagnerian opera than anything ever worn by any Norseman, ever. But what fascinated me, right from the words of the Norwegian captain, right in 1960, to this book here and to this, was that it's not just a one-way street. It's kind of a two-way telescope. So just as we're aware of them, somewhere out there, they're aware of us. And I think that's very precious. I think this book is a treasure. And somebody see tak for me.